He's totally dedicated to climbing. Um, I don't think there's anybody else that puts in the same amount of hours and training as he does. Every day for the last, it must be 15 years now, he's climbed or trained for climbing. And he never, never loses his dedication, that's the amazing thing. I mean, most of us, when we go climbing, after a while we get fed up with it and we just want to, you know, have a break for a couple of days. But Ron doesn't, he always wants to go climbing, and more and more climbing all the time. I, I like the danger aspect in climbing. Um, it's not something that is all important. The most important thing to me is to, to actually do the moves, to, to get up the piece of rock without using any artificial aids. It's just hands and feet. Uh, but obviously, uh, when, you're, when you're up there and in the back of your mind you know that if you fall off you're going to hurt yourself, there's, uh, the adrenaline starts to pump and you get this kick that's hard to explain. It's, it doesn't come with any other sport that I know of. The gorge of the River Verdun in the bottom right-hand corner of France. Just as Muslims turn towards Mecca and mountaineers converge on the nearby Alps, rock climbers are drawn towards these limestone cliffs up to 3,000 feet high. For Ron Fawcett, the lure from the bleaker fastness of his North Derbyshire home is irresistible. Southern sunshine and the chance to take on Europe's crack climbers. Good and feeling fine. <laughs> oh, this rock is just so good. The challenges of the Verdun are vastly different from the short but fearsome British climbs where Ron Fawcett made his reputation, leading a newspaper to headline him as the fingertip phenomenon. Here, huge slabs of bare rock have been conquered by climbers who first drove steel bolts into the cliff wall and used them as climbing aids. But Ron is a purist. Ropes and runners, pitons and bolts are for safety purposes only. For the actual climbing, it's hands and feet against the rock. When you're climbing in the Verdon, the first thing that hits you is the exposure of the place. You have to abseil down from the top, so you've immediately got this immense drop beneath your feet. And very often, the cliff is overhanging, so uh, the, the only thing beneath your feet is... 3,000 foot drop down to the really river good. in the bottom of the gorge. To rival climbers, stunned at the speed and boldness of Ron's climbing, it looks as if he doesn't even know the drop's there. But nobody can ignore the sheer space the Verdon puts around you. This is where I go left onto it wall here. Right. It's strange, really. You often end up shaking on a move. Um, where you know you're perfectly safe. Even if you fall off, you're only going to go a couple of metres at the most. And you, you're not going to hurt yourself, but you, you end up shaking. It's a, a funny situation, really. Uh, I, I think it's something to do with the exposure of the place, really, and the, the, the atmosphere. If Ron or his partner, Jerry Peel, do come off, they should just be left dangling in space. One of two nylon ropes linking the men is always clipped to the bolts. On the ground, Ron can seem shy. Perched precariously up a crag, he's an extrovert in his element. Good old Ron, eh? Oh, this is fantastic, Jerry. <laughs> really good. Brother. Stick orange in that, eh? Yeah. Just incredible, this. Really good. Big holes again, Ron, eh? Yeah, right, Jerry. Big holes again. Oh, yeah. Side of here. Whew. Do me. They look a bit hard up there. Well, it's steady enough here, but I think it gets a bit harder. Ron is Britain's first and only professional rock climber. Jerry, a painter and decorator by trade, is highly rated, but he can't match the other man's total commitment. He just eats and sleeps climbing. That's that's Ron all over. He's just not bothered about. Oh, it doesn't seem to be bothered about anything else. I think he must be, but uh, 
he's not bothered about possessions or a fancy motor or fancy clothes. He's just, well, one of the main things about Ron, he puts a lot into it. So it's like lots of sportsmen, they, what you put into something, you, you get out of it eventually. And Ron put lots into it over the years and eventually came out on top. In Britain, Ron has improved climbing standards by quantum leaps. But in places like the Verdun, too, he's earned the respect of continental right, climbers yeah. by his free ascent of routes previously climbed with artificial aids. He hopes to add to his tally on this trip. The climbers base themselves at La Palu, one of the high Provencal villages that somehow survive being on the edge of a major tourist attraction only a short day trip away from the French Riviera. Eventually, the trippers go back to the casino in Nice or the topless beaches near Saint-Tropez. Mr. Fawcett's party travels a little rougher. The fourth strong team reunites towards dusk at the village campsite. Oh, all right. Oh, good route. Oh, yeah, cracking route. Yeah, really yeah. good. Some time for a brew, eh? Yeah. Yeah, just boiled. Good enough. I'll play mother, eh? Right. Spotted this other thing as well. Whereabouts? Just near that thing we did today. I don't know where it is, though. Hold on. Hi, I'll have a look at the book. Ta. I think we'll see it. Yeah. Chris Gibb, an electrician who was once Ron's regular yeah, partner, right. is another fine climber. So is Ron's wife. Jill Fawcett is one of the best women climbers in Britain. Big and great. Ta. There's a little in there. But none of them will stretch Ron as he stretches them on this French summer adventure. Because back in the Derbyshire winter, climbing will still be Ron's job. I'm in England, I'm really the first pure professional rock climber. Obviously, other people make a living from guiding and working in outdoor centres, but nobody actually makes a living purely from sponsorship like we do. I'm very lucky in that I'm sponsored by two companies and uh, I sort of develop equipment for them and test new products and such like. Because obviously I, I climb every day so that I can put gear to the test in two weeks, whereas it might take somebody who climbs only a little bit, a year to find out the faults or whatever of a certain piece of equipment. Well, there are conflicts between trying to make a living from climbing and climbing because obviously if you want to climb all the time then you don't want to be bothered um, writing articles, taking photographs, doing lectures because you want to spend all your time climbing. Um, being married helps it I think because I help him with the business side of things and try and take the pressures off him on that side so that he can climb all the time. How successfully or not I don't know but I try to do my bit. There isn't that much money in, in being a professional rock climber in England that's for sure but on the continent things are totally different. For example um, a German climber who does just the same thing I do in Munich. He's a technical advisor to a couple of companies and he drives around in a Porsche Turbo uh, I obviously don't, but uh, I go over to Europe, I make a few pennies over there by doing lectures and such like, which is maybe the direction I may go into. Uh, we'll live for the moment, really. We'll live for today. Uh, I'm lucky enough to still be able to climb at a high standard. That's great. Lucky isn't the half of it. Ron climbs to a high standard because he sets himself a high standard and he's single-minded. He lives near his work and every day in all but the very worst weather he'll clamber up these barren outcrops without artificial aids or safety gear. Solo climbs taking a few minutes where other reputable climbers might labour for an hour. As many in a day as a weekend climber will do all year. One of Ron's most visible assets is the power in his fingers. If you look at Ron's hands, you'll see that they're, uh, they're over large. They seem to have been developed. Just, this is just by climbing. The fingers are huge. It's impossible for him to straighten his fingers out because they seem to be uh, just grown into a, like a claw position, you might say. And one of the things, when you're climbing all the time, you build up thick calluses on your skin and when we train on climbing walls, on brick edges, or even on sharp, sharp edges on the rock, it 
often has a lot of problems with the skin splitting from climbing every day. Personally, I don't care whether I get to a summit or not. Um, a piece of rock will do for me. Um, I might not even climb to the top of that piece of rock. I might go around it. Uh, the actual m moves on rock are the most important thing to me. Today, it's, it's incredible the numbers of people that actually are rock climbing. Um, you, you look at the Peak District, for example. Um, the, the, shit, the cities of Manchester and Sheffield are very near. There are lads that come out here every single day, even during the winter. They're unemployed, nothing else to do. And so they train and train and train. So obviously, today there are maybe 50 climbers that are right up there in the pecking order, so to speak. Unemployment may have created full-time climbers, as it did in the 20s, but nobody so far with the stomach for the paperwork and lack of compromise of professionalism. Ron's a lorry driver's son from the Yorkshire Dales, who was a teacher before he made climbing his job. Jill, a pure maths graduate, still takes occasional teaching jobs to supplement the money coming into their cottage. But the partnership doesn't divide simply into Jill doing the groundwork while Ron gets on with the climbing. For their honeymoon in 1981, they went climbing. And Jill's own standard has been radically improved by climbing with Ron. Though spread-eagled halfway up an overhanging crack with 350 feet of space below, there's no question who takes the lead. Is that good? Yeah, really incredible. Oh, I've already did that. Oh. You got it? No. Sorry. Pull it through. Cheers. I thought you were going for blue again. Mm. You'll be struggling on these bridges, lass. Yeah, well, keep the ropes snug. <laughs> I'll be watching it, don't you? Yeah, that's a good hole. Oh, Ron, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Good for the arms. <laughs> Women often have a better sense of balance, which is very good on rock that isn't vertical. Um, and often they're a lot more supple in the hips, which means better weight distribution. And they can use their feet better, so they can take a lot of strain off the arms. When you come to overhanging rock, then a lot of it does come straight onto your arms, so the men have the upper hand there. And on the Gol de l'Amour, one of the newest and most overhanging ascents in the Verdun, it's reach that counts. Ron is six foot three, Jill five foot four. Hey, OK, Jill. Oh, right, oh, right. Hand up to the other side of it. It's all right saying that. It's not quite so easy as that. Ooh, I'm ruining something. Jill? Yeah? Are you OK? Yeah, keep it. Nice and... You what? Oh, you can't reach that one. Oh, oops. But yeah, I nearly slipped off then. A bit better. Gillian! You, you better keep it nice and tight. Nice and snug, eh? I am doing. Oh, bloody hell. <sighs> That's a fairly nice one there. I have to have a bit of a blow. You OK? Yeah, I'm just having a blow. Oh, I'm off. 
better. But Jill completes her dogged progress to the top, and it's only fair that Ron should respond by tearing himself away from the rock and indulging his wife's taste for a little sightseeing. There are other ways of appreciating the gorge than hanging by one hand jammed into a crack in the cliff. A few tourist roads now snake down the gentler slopes towards the river. Even the laziest trippers can tackle the cliffs with a camera. But from here on, it's Shanks's pony. The gorge hadn't been explored at all until 1905, when the geologist Edouard Martel tried to go down the river by boat. He capsized a hundred times and wrecked two skiffs out of three. Even with today's engineering techniques, it hasn't been possible to maintain a footpath along the bottom by the water's edge. But a series of stairways and tunnels brings walkers to windows, beyond which the limestone towers breathtakingly and a little threateningly from the narrowest part of the gorge. In a very few places, it's possible to get right down to the river. It goes against the grain for a climber to use a ladder, even one as rickety and twisted as this. But it's reckoned to be all right if you're only playing. And a mountain stream's temptation enough to play in the hot sun, especially if you carry the gear to construct your own adventure playground. Mind, it could be a mistake for Jerry Peel to arrive last and on his own at the point where the rope dips with his weight on it. Pretty soon it becomes clear that all this is a frivolous diversion for Ron. As ever, when he's surrounded by rock, his eyes start to flicker speculatively upwards. Not at the scenery, for Ron it's just so much potential climbing. The sides of the gorge are laced with roots put up by the star continental climbers, and the itch to take them on gets stronger. Minutes later, he's already formed his plans. The others can take the long walk back. He's going solo up the Demand, one of the classic routes of the Verdun. 2,000 feet, no pegs, no ropes, no safety helmet even. If he falls off now, it wouldn't save his life anyway. I've always enjoyed climbing alone. It's really stemmed from being in the Peak District. There's nobody to climb with, really. I go out midweek with nobody to, to climb with, so I end up soloing, climbing on my own. It was a natural progression to, for me, really, to want to climb one of the big routes in the Verdon alone. I chose the demand uh, because the technical difficulty of the route isn't incredibly high, uh, but it's a long route. I walked down there with a few friends and we saw this incredible crack line uh, shooting up the main cliff and I decided that must be it. So I just put my boots on and set out up the route. Oh. Soloing like this is officially frowned on and with good reason. One mistake can prove fatal. But it's the purest form of climbing, hands and feet against the rock. <sighs> Ron's remarkable reach takes him up to eight feet five from toe hold to the next hand hold. The strength in his fingers, which are dusted with chalk to stop sweat making them slip, then repeatedly hauls up his 11 stone eight without flagging. Arms and leg muscles press and press again like pneumatic props against the side of the crack. The whole body is brought into play, but fitness and strength and technique don't eliminate all the hazards of the climb. Fingers are greasy. Loose rock when you're soloing is something that you have to come to terms with. It's not like using a, a, a loose handhold when you're leading, uh, especially if there's a piece of protection right next to you. You know that if that lump of rock comes off, 
you, you're not really going to hurt yourself. You might fall a few feet, but that's it. When you're soloing, a handhold or a foothold breaks, you're going to fall to the bottom of the cliff. So you have to take um, extra precautions, especially on some of these crack pitches, because the rock is quite loose in places. Uh, it can be quite scary. Once you start wondering if, if this holds safe, that holds safe, um, it gets to a stage where you, you don't actually want to go on because you, you're so worried about the rock. But uh, then again, if, if you don't want to go on, you've got to climb back down again, which can be a lot harder and a lot more dangerous than, than climbing up. The last few strides Ron makes seem absurdly simple, like a boy scrambling at the seaside. But like all fearless men, he can be the victim of his own nerve. He's broken each heel, each ankle, and each wrist more than once. And he can't even remember exactly what happened last time. We were working on a film down in uh, Wales in the Clamberries Pass. And after the film was over, in the evening, uh, all the others went down to the pub for a celebratory drink. And I hadn't had enough training that day, so I decided to go climbing on my own. And uh, I was up on a crag in the Clamberries Pass, Clogwini Grocken. And uh, I remember it was dusk, very nearly dark. Uh, I was soloing around, climbing on my own. And the next thing I, I knew, I was lying on the ground. It was pitch black, and my sheepdog was licking my face. And I sort of came round, and uh, I noticed that my wrist was at rather a nasty angle. And I'd obviously broken it, so I sort of straightened it up and stuffed it in my pocket and wandered down to the road with the dog. Uh, it was dark and my car was about three miles, four miles away and uh, there was a, a couple there in a vehicle who didn't want to give me a lift because of my dog. Uh, but anyway, never mind. I walked down into Clamberries and then we drove home. And that was that really. I was in plaster for five weeks. Okay, Joe. Okay, love. Here I go. Wow, wow, wow. Mm. Oh, I could get off this stance, mm. isn't it? This bloody thing. Ooh. Okay. Okay, yeah. <sighs> Peg it. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Whichever one. Blue. Blue, yeah. Another thread up there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll clip that into the same rope, eh? Right, yo. Okay. Diddy. Hot doggy. Woo. Looks an awkward bit. Chalk it up well, then. I will, I will. Now then. Oh, so lay back. Lay back. Ooh, what a reach. A good one. Yeah. Really good yoga. Not that good then. Oh, smashing. Thank goodness. Yeah. It's nice climbing this. Is it? Yeah, really good. Another peg. Another runner up there, I'll get one ready. Another runner? Just above, yeah. Okay. Looks like an interesting bit. <laughs> to say the least. <sighs> Orange again. Okay. Got it. Oh, have now. Good. <sighs> really funny hole, that one. <sighs> really good jug. Oh, up, up and over on the left. <sighs> TF yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. 
goes deli cow on you again, yeah? It's really nice, this. Nearly at a stance now, Jill. Great. Couple of bolts. Get in there. It's clipping on now, Ath. OK. Be safe. 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 I'll take you off. OK. Hang on. Yeah. I'm just tying on anyway. There's enough slack there. You're off. Cheers. Right. I'll take in then. OK. OK, I'm climbing. Right, I'm watching you. Oh, I could move off the stance. You're right. Especially for a little in. <laughs> There's 1,500 feet of space below Jill Fawcett as she sets off up the route her husband's marked out on an ascent called Chrysalis in the Verdon Gorge. You can't tell area? where the personal part of their relationship ends and the professional begins. Ron Fawcett's decision to make climbing his job turned an adventure into a way of life. It's a perilous way to earn a crust, physically and financially, but it's also a way of chasing that late 20th century dream, being in charge of your own life. Oh, that's lovely. Big old. <laughs> yeah. Magic. So far, so good. Yeah. And another one. Oh, can I stay here for a while? So you've got to sort of... You move up there, a little hole on the slab, yeah. And then just stick your foot up into that big pocket. That's it. In there. Put your foot up in that big hole. What big hole? There's a big pocket, do you? Oh, yes. Sorry, I never saw that. Oh. And then up on the right. Oh. Put the right down there. Oh, sink it. Right, up again into the other big jug pocket. What oh, are you missing there? Monster foothold for your right foot, Jill. From the right foot? Yeah, a big, big hole over there that you had to jump. Oh. You've gone too far now. Just try cranking it now, the big foot will buy your way. Whew. All right? Yeah. Come across underneath if you can. Underneath? Yeah. You. A little marital impatience can assume alarming proportions when you're clinging like a spider to a foreign cliff. Jill is climbing somewhere near her personal limit here. All right? Yeah. But while it's obviously true that Ron's helping his wife up this climb, it's also the case that he couldn't do it by himself. And his safety depends on her skill and concentration just as much as on his own. Yeah, I am doing love, don't worry. Hey? I am watching you. Yeah. Most couples know about the need for mutual trust. It doesn't often take such a palpably physical form. Take her out, sink the way. <laughs> well done. Is that hard? Yeah, it is hard. It looked it. <laughs> Ooh. I am now. <laughs> oh, Ooh, good jog. The runner, plugged into the rock, is there to hold the safety rope only. That's it. Not 
that big pocket. Now, that goes that way. No, no. That goes that, that way. That, yeah. <laughs> That's it. If she hauled herself up on it, Jill could join her husband, waiting more or less patiently at the top, much more quickly. But that would turn it from a free climb to an aided climb, and in the Fawcett's book, that would be akin to cheating. Where are you, Jill? What? Where are you? I'm just... Uh... Just below that tree. Oh, you look on that! Pulling up on that what? That uh, hold. <laughs> I'm just in that little groove. Yeah. That tricky one. In the English winter, every day not spent in full-time climbing, Ron Fawcett undertakes a training schedule that would punish any athlete. Four circuits of a demanding program of weight training are followed by a seven-mile run with his sheepdog, Bill. If you find somewhere flat to run in the Peak District, 10 to 1 it's man-made, like the edge of an old dam built to serve a mill wheel. There'll always be those who say Ron Fawcett's taking the fun as well as the amateurishness out of climbing. He doesn't smoke, drinks very little, and is rumoured to wear rubber gloves in the bath so his hands don't get soft. Others may belittle his achievement by saying it's all down to fitness, not talent, but his natural gift speaks for itself. At 16, within a year of starting climbing, he'd done most of the hardest routes in Britain. It can't all be explained by his build, either. The sort of physical shape of a climber does help on certain routes. For example, I've got really big hands, wide fingers. It's very difficult for me sometimes to get them into thin cracks. Um, but there again, if it's a wide crack, and my fingers fit in perfectly where somebody with thin fingers couldn't couldn't jam them in. Uh, the main thing is reach, I think. It, it enables me to reach over moves where other people, like the white Jill, just cannot physically get between those two holes. If the weather makes climbing impossible, there's a session on the indoor wall in Buxton between the run and another round of circuits. Fingertips and toes, harnessed by nerve and controlled movement, are tested on holds a fraction of an inch deep. The ability to work alone at his technique is what links the athlete with the performing artist. The rock climber adds physical danger to that equation. So is there anything Ron and those coming after him can't achieve? I personally think that climbers have reached a limit, technically, um, of what they can do. I think it's, it's only possible to pull up on such a small hold. Uh, I don't think technically things will go very much further, but I think what's going to happen is people are going to get fitter and stronger and be able to climb more technical moves, one after the other, to be able to... Um, do the hardest moves of today, yet string three and four and five moves of this standard together onto some incredible overhanging rock. On the long routes of the Verdun, there are plenty of barren rocks apparently impossible to climb without artificial aids. But making impossible moves possible and then stringing them together is Ron's stock in trade. There has to be a line at that wall, doesn't there, to the right? Up that shattered bit, looks blank there, though, to that roof. Yeah. There's another bolt there, isn't there, right in the middle of the roof? Purple sling above that. Yeah. And it, it looks to ease then, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. You see that? The pinnacle down there. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh. That big broken thing. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There looks to be a roof to the middle of that wall, to the right of it, doesn't yeah. there? Yeah. It comes into this, this groove, I think, doesn't it? And to a bolt there. Yeah, there's a bolt. It looks to be in the middle of nowhere, that thing, though. Yeah. yeah. 
Watched by tourists at the Belvedere, Ron and Jerry Peel have had their sights on a climb called Piche for some little while. It's a long climb, the longest in the Verdun, and one short section has never been climbed without artificial aids. Ron and Jerry have been casing this section. They want to do the whole climb free. Ron's put up plenty of completely new routes in his time, some of them so difficult a new category had to be introduced to describe them. But the Verdun is so big that new routes here can take days to prepare, literally hanging about on an abseil rope and hammering in safety bolts. Ron hasn't that sort of time, patience or temperament. His urge is always to get down and get climbing. In the cafe that night, there's the usual fraternisation with French climbers, but it's a competitive sport, and one thing Ron doesn't do is to tell them his plans. Of course, it's easier not to give things away when you don't speak much of each other's language. Next week, perhaps English and also chrysalis. Promising dawn, thick mist in the gorge, but no sign of the thunderstorms that crashed through the valley. The day begins startlingly early for British climbers. Nobody's stirring yet in the streets of La Palou, but any expedition in the Verdun is a long one, and the gorge may be like an oven by early afternoon. Like most of the ascents in the Verdun, Pichneboul is a descent first. You can only get at it from the top. There's a fixed point to clip a rope to. Each rope is over 150 feet long, and Ron and Jerry will abseil down nine rope lengths to reach their starting point. At the bottom of the cliff, there are telltale discolorations of the normally pale grey limestone. It means the rock is liable to be loose and crumbly. And as if the route's not long enough, Ron and Jerry have to go up and down a small pinnacle before they can get cracking on the climb proper. All right. Yeah. Oh, this is dodgy, a, bit, a bit loose down that pinnacle thing. What are you doing? Get a finger jam with it? Ah, you get stumped down there. Mm. Yeah, on that. Bend that one, right? Hey? Ah, right, good. Bending a bit, that. Hell, <laughs> how have we both on that? <laughs> You're right. Right, rise up next pitch then. All right then, JP. Yes, sir. Well, fire up that next pitch then. Round the corner, eh? Still a bit loose, Ron, but. Aye. 
supposed to get better, eh? I hope so. Nowhere is the Verdun more majestic than either side of Pichniboul. The climb doesn't go straight up the perpendicular cliff, but slants, first diagonally to the right and then diagonally to the left, forming a long letter V tipped over on its side. The ascent includes 18 separate pitches, a pitch being the distance you climb in one burst from each stance. It's limited by the lie of the rock and your 150-foot rope. So far from getting really hot, it's turned surprisingly chilly. Cold muscles become tired muscles, draining away Ron and Jerry's strength. And they have to make their supreme effort near the top of the cliff to go past what Ron calls a bolt ladder. To make the first free ascent, Ron must reach the bolts to clip on the rope, but not pull himself up on them. Blue's pulling me off. Oh, you twat. <sighs> All right, Ron, can't just control yeah. it. I've got you. Coming off doesn't count as a failure on a climb like this, but it does offend Ron's sense of style. More important, each jolting drop as the rope tightens or his heels dash against the cliff wall saps his strength for the next painful stretch. Coming off, Jerry. Yeah. Pulled of ten tonight. Carruthers. It's like fitting together the pieces of some fiendish jigsaw. You can only do one near impossible move if you've already done the near impossible move that comes before it. And it's a puzzle that nobody's yet put together. This is the physical and psychological territory Ron has made his own, and it hurts. <sighs> No, I didn't oh, Sorry, Jerry. <laughs> Tell us when you're in. In. It's fitness, not brute strength, that means Ron can recover enough from each shuddering stretch and drop to reach out for the next one and find the hold or the runner. OK, Jerry. OK, Jerry. Go on. <laughs> fitness and willpower, a classic case of putting more in and getting more out. And slowly, the old exultation wells up inside him. Flack on. Uh, orange, please. Go on. Got it. Woo! Got it. Are you in? Yeah. Good lad. Black blue, Jerry. <sighs> Why put yourself through the pain and danger when you could haul yourself up on a rope? 
Why climb rocks at all when you don't need to get from the bottom to the top? It's a question that if you need to ask it, you can't really hope to answer. Except to see the grace and exhilaration attached to something that's extremely hard to do being done extremely well by an athlete at the very limit of what's possible. As for Pishnibul, it was an aided route and now goes down in the climbing guidebooks as a free route. But as anyone watching can see, it's not just the rock the freedom's attached to, but the man who gets up it. Tremendous, that. <clears throat> desperate. Ooh. You're desperate. Hardest thing in the world. <laughs> Get away. Have a rest now, eh? Oh, aye. Get a brew. Oh. 